Lisa Reitzman is the founder and director of Street Soccer USA Sacramento. She lives and breathes this month's theme. For Lisa, soccer is more than just a game, it's a catalyst for change. When Lisa hit rock bottom and nearly died from addiction, she pulled herself up through the love of the game. And it's how she's now how she's changing lives with Street Soccer USA. It's a nationwide nonprofit that uses soccer to break the cycle of homelessness and domestic abuse. For Lisa, the soccer field is a canvas. It's a platform for ideas and creative problem solving to be executed. For someone like me who prefers loner physical activities, <laughs> she's really inspired me about the power of teams and how lives truly can be changed through the game. So please join me in welcoming Lisa Reitzman. Thank you. Um, let me mess with my mic a little bit and just make sure we can get like a decent volume. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah? Cool. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, thanks for the, the volunteers that put this together and, and helped me uh, to get up here and tell my story. I mean, you just did it, so that's awesome. <laughs> uh, and uh, Britt helped me out with kind of finding a best way to fill the 20 minutes. So, um, so we'll kind of begin, but, but thanks again for having me. So um, the game for me, uh, and I think most people kind of feel when they hear the word game, maybe it registers more as a competition, something about winning and losing, um, and maybe necessarily not something that's inclusive. If you aren't like the best, the fast, or the strongest, a game may not be the space for you. And, uh, and I was actually, that was a big part of my life too, and that's how I viewed the game, and that's how I uh, pursued it. I wanted to win, and I wanted to be the best, and that was, that was the avenue for me. But most recently, in the last uh, eight-ish years, I've learned a new way to kind of perceive the game. And when I hear that word now, it's very different. It means um, inclusivity to me. I've learned that we can find a space for all ages and backgrounds. And, um, and it can really be kind of what you know, Rebecca mentioned for me is, is a catalyst for change for people in many different ways and a path to self-discovery. Um, so I'm going to kind of give you my story and my experience with it, and, and then hopefully you can maybe look at, at the game in a similar way. Um, so, so I grew up playing soccer, but before I played soccer, my first experiences in play were very competitive. I have an older brother, a couple years older than me, and I had a lot of babysitters who had a lot of boys. So they were always boys two or three years older than me, and if I wanted to play, I had to compete with them and sort of prove that I could be tough enough to participate. And they weren't going to make it easy for me. Um, but also, the other side of it for me, like I was a really hyper kid, so I needed to be moving. And everybody agreed that that was a good decision. So they didn't have a problem with me running around like with these boys. Um, we played soccer, kickball, whatever you play in the streets, football, flag football, and then it turned into tackle football. And I was a small kid. so. When I was um, running for the touchdown, it wasn't to score a touchdown, it was to stay alive. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> the touchdown was just like the byproduct. <laughs> and that was my first kind of experiences with sports, was like, out of fear, I became very fast. So then, you move forward into, you know, where I was old enough to play in organized sports and with other girls, it was my soccer teams. And then when I went and played with them, I was like the fastest, and they couldn't figure out why I was running with such urgency. It's like, so now I can move and score goals. I wasn't running for my life anymore, like it was a little different. But I found a lot of success in that, and I was always the best player, and I could always score a lot of goals, so I got a lot of value, positive affirmation, and I was young, but getting a lot of confidence mostly from, from the sport. Um, and also, like while I was playing games, I wasn't worried about other things in life. So it was a real nice escape for me. Um, I continued to go on and play college. I did really well. It served as a similar um, space for me where it was um, what I was best at, what I got a lot of self-esteem out of. Um, you could say ego, too. <laughs> like, um, but also, in those years for college, for me, it was a place of acceptance. This was where my community was. This was where I, I'm an emotional person, and soccer can be an emotional game, and that's how I played. I played through my emotions, which made me um, able to be creative, because I wasn't, um, I was feeling. You know, and even, uh, I mentioned that this was kind of like a canvas for me in a lot of ways, because 
Um, it allowed me to be creative, and it allowed me to express myself, but this was the only space that I knew how to really process life and feelings. So um, when I left college and wanted to go play professional soccer, um, the professional league was, it folded, so it was no longer available, it was no longer an option. And up until this point, everything in my life since I was about eight was around soccer. The school I went to was around soccer. The friends I had was around soccer. The, the classes I took in college were around soccer. The jobs I had were like, well, would it fit my soccer schedule? And so when that could no longer be a priority, I had a really hard time um, reprioritizing like something that I'd be you know, happy about. And this was also like the place of joy for me. Um, but uh, when, when that happened, besides not having a lot of direction anymore, I had this huge sense of void because I kind of lost my community, I lost my structure, I lost the place where you know, I got a lot of confidence and esteem out of. So I filled um, those unhappy you know, feelings with, with a lot of drugs and alcohol because they just made me feel better. <laughs> so, so I used those to make myself feel better until it stopped working, essentially. And that took about uh, six years. So in 2009, um, you know, I started, uh, well, I ended up using meth, and that made me feel really good. And then I got in a lot of trouble using that. So this is where I ended up, and uh, this was definitely, like, the lowest moment for me in my life, meaning that, well, I mean, you look at it, it's pretty, like, happy, sad. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I was <laughs> like... Alone, depressed, the, the toughest thing, this wasn't the first time that I landed in jail, um, but it was the most significant because this was a, there was a chance I was going to be there for a while, and I had, was looking at felonies for possession and things. So for me, in my mind, it wasn't like, how am I going to restart my life? It was like, how am I going to fix all the things that I have to fix and then restart my life? Like, I have a college degree, and I have felonies. I don't have a license because I have DUIs. Um, like, I don't have family that trusts me anymore. I don't have friends that trust me. There was just, it was just seemed impossible. So the, the overwhelming feeling was really like making me suicidal. Luckily, I was in a place like this, so I couldn't really do anything about it. Um, but eventually realized like if I wanted to live, I was gonna need to get sober. So uh, when I did get let out, uh, I went to rehab and figured out like the sobriety thing. And the sobriety thing was really like, how can I be normal? I need to be normal. I don't want to have an exciting life anymore. I don't want to do exciting things. I don't want to do scary things. I just want to be safe and normal. I don't want to get a normal job, and I just want to have normal money and normal things. <laughs> and nothing exciting. And so that's what I went to rehab and sobriety, and I was learning it. And, and that seemed like the bar. Like most people were just living like a very normal life, and that was cool. Nobody was really excited about it, but we were, we were grateful that we were alive and that there was a place for us in the community. Um, and so, so I went from a couple of things I learned in rehab, actually, that, that really stuck with me. One was um, I had never met anybody who was like uh, growing up uh, like a, an addict or an alcoholic who was no longer an addict or an alcoholic. So my exposure to what that was, was was a little bit different. Like my idea of that was maybe somebody who was on the street still. So you're like, well, why do I want to be an addict if like that's what I'm going to be? So this was kind of the first time I learned that there was sort of a way of existing, you know, and having some kind of life, you know, normal, normal life. Um, and then the other thing I learned was like about the women. This is a very interesting experience, it's like a 90-day rehab residential program. Um, with the women, there was like 20 other women in this place, and I learned a lot of things, but one thing that stuck with me the most that's relative to this is as much of, we all lost everything, basically. Like, we were in there because we had just bottomed out. The only thing these women hung on to was how much they didn't like each other still. <laughs> like, and this was weird to me because I, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was, it was so weird to me because I grew up playing sports. I was always around women, and I was around women and people that I didn't like all the time, and we still, we still played together, like that wasn't a thing. And so I realized, like for these women, that was something they were really missing. And the, the, you know, the significance of that is that if they're trying to rebuild their lives and they can't build new relationships with people they have something in common with, like the chances of them succeeding are so slim. And, and any rehab will tell you, like they expect one out of 10 people to actually stay sober. But I think that's a bigger part of it. It's not just the sobriety, with a lot of social skills too. So, so flash forward, so, um, water. 
No, Phil's coffee. Um, so I'm working on my normal life. And I, I get into a transitional living for, uh, for getting a job and building my credit back up and getting my license back and all these things that will help me be, you know, normal again. And as I'm moving into this place, the, the case manager that I was going to have runs up to me and he's like, hey, you play soccer, right? I was like, yeah, like I did, you know. He's like, cool, we have a soccer team here and I think you should join. <laughs> like, kind of, I was kind of like, what? Dude, I'm here to build a normal life. <laughs> like, what does soccer have to do with sobriety, getting a job, any of these things? And I was a little bit, like, upset. I was like, you went through my whole file, and this is what you hung on to? <laughs> like, drug addict doesn't stand out to you? <laughs> Social issues, none of these things seem problematic? Um, and so I, I declined his invitation. And uh, he, he was very persistent. And so him and these guys that had this soccer team, they kept kind of coming at me. They're like, you should play, you should play. And I was like, fine, like, I'll go out and play. This is not like, I just want to paint a visual for you. This is not like your typical soccer team. These guys didn't know what they were doing. They're huge dudes. This is a homeless shelter recovery place. Gang members, lifelong drug users, chronic homeless, a lot of teeth, not a lot of teeth. You get shaved heads, you get tattoos, like the big dudes trying to kick a soccer ball around. It was hilarious to me. And I'm just like, what is this? Like, and. And I went out and, and I played with them and it was honestly the most fun I had had in like years, like years. And it was the first time I had felt that freedom again and that, that joy. And the soccer was terrible, but it just kind of like, uh, it kicked me back into sort of like this excitement that I hadn't had because I'm trying to be normal. So, um, so, so that was like, I stuck with them, and there's this new sense of community now. We, they were actually getting ready for a street soccer USA national tournament that was going to be held in Washington, D.C. So a bunch of us, like hoodlums, we like this motley crew of us, we get our belongings, we, we travel to, to Washington, D.C. together, and I have this like, amazing experience at this event. And we meet like 12 other cities who have these homeless street soccer teams. So everybody at this tournament who was playing was either currently like living in a shelter or they have just recently gotten out of homelessness. So you can, you can imagine that a lot, some soccer was good, some was not, but um, we were given uniforms, so we looked legit. Um, this is, we, I was on the team called the Mohawks, the Mohawk. Uh, didn't have a job yet, so it was fine. Uh, and it was just kind of like uh, an eye-opening experience for me because this was the first time sober that I had really witnessed or experienced a, a piece of life that I was like, this is exciting. After this event, I was like, I'm ready for an exciting life. Like, I want some of this if I can have it and be sober. And when we got to this thing, a couple of things that were real impactful was uh, we were greeted by the founders of the tournament and they immediately said, like, thank you to us for coming. And we're used to, the, you know, my team and I, we're used to being like, filled with shame, like judged for the decisions we've made. No, no one's really said thank you to us for a long time. And, and that was interesting to me. Um, and I remembered it because it was like just the first time I hadn't felt judgment in a very long time. And, and I was like, oh, there's people out there that maybe won't judge us and we can actually move forward. Um, and another thing that happened at this event was um, I was nominated to go to Brazil to play uh, with the first time we'd have an all women's street soccer USA national team. Um, we're going to play in the Homeless World Cup. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with soccer, but there's a thing called the World Cup, <laughs> and then there's the Homeless World Cup. <laughs> and nobody dreams about going to the Homeless World Cup. <laughs> But, you know, either way, in my mind, I was like, this could be my comeback because <laughs> surely I will stand out against these homeless players and they'll want me to play professional soccer back in America. So, um, so I uh, went to Brazil and I'm in the mindset that we're going to win. And this was sick. It was in Copacabana Beach. They had these soccer pitches up. We're like playing on the beach. It wasn't a bad place to be. I thought it was funny that like, I had to go through this route to actually get to Brazil to play an event. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, and I actually had friends who were playing in the World Cup, the real one, at the same time. So it was just like, you know, the irony is laughable. Uh, so we go there, I'm thinking that we're gonna win, this is my comeback, this is my destiny, I'm gonna be a soccer player. Um, and then I meet my teammates. 
and they're, I love them all. Um, <laughs> they are not soccer players either. <laughs> And you know, in this event, there's like 450 players all around the world, about 60 countries represented. All of their teams are um, considered homeless by their definition within the last year to participate. So again, some teams are really good, but the, the idea is not to, to win and be a, good, uh, to be a good team. It's just like really celebrating the accomplishments that people have made through the game. And our team um, ranged from ages 18 to 65. And some of them don't really know anything about soccer at all, but they loved the game, and this was, they learned playing in their shelter, and this is what was motivating them to wake up every morning. They believed they were soccer players, and it was enough to make them feel proud to be there um, and be a part of the team. You know, and the first game we went into, I, I was like, maybe I could win for us, and like, <laughs> could not. <laughs> this is, nothing I could do would, would get us to win a game. Um, but what I learned from them was that being a part of the team was so valuable. They, they, were, they had confidence, they had self-esteem, they were um, motivated, they had purpose, and they weren't good. And that was what stuck with me, because I grew up thinking like the only way you get things out is by being good. So this was really interesting to me that, um, that these women, you know, they, they were driven by something, and this is really the inclusivity of the tournament. But, you know, they're not your typical athletes, but they were able to get all the positive things that come out of being on a team sport. So that stuck with me. So I came back home. We won one game. It was 7-7. Seven to seven. No, no, 8-7. to seven, And I scored all of the goals. Uh, and that was like our big thing, and we felt like we won the World Cup. So, so I come back home, and um, with the, the idea in my mind stuck that, like, if these women could be bad and get these things that I know they need, that I was getting, gaining from being a part of the team, like we should start a team in Sacramento for women. So that was kind of what we did. And we um, were working with women at the homeless shelter that I was at or the transitional, shattered self-esteem, no confidence, coming from domestic violence situations. They fled with their kids, so they're alone, they're new in sobriety, and they're facing the same challenges that I did right out of jail. Like how do I rebuild, rebuild my life? And, um, and it's not exciting, it just is overwhelming. So. Um, we've had really good outcomes, um, and I'm going to tell you a story in a second, but we've had really good outcomes as far as we've had about seven teams, and the idea is to practice with a team for a year and then take them to a national cup. And then when they go to a national cup, something changes, and they come back, and they're, they're no longer afraid to pursue life. But we've had like 90% of our women maintain sobriety, 90% um, have permanent housing, 85% are working, and we don't provide those things. We provide you know, the, the esteem and the confidence that they need to go pursue it and the support. So, so this last story, I'm, I've actually never been able to tell it, I'm really excited. Uh, we took a team to New York. And this was our team. And the other thing is like, uh, street soccer, it's small, it's like four against four. And, you know, again with the women, they don't like each other when they come out to play. They don't come to us as a team. They come to us as individuals who want to take a trip to the National Cup. They're like, fine. So you know then that if you want to go to this trip, you have to have teammates. And they're like, I understand. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so they learn to tolerate each other. And then eventually they become friends because they grow respect for each other. So they wanted to go to this tournament in New York. And this particular trip, I think it was the oldest women that we had on a team. Almost everybody in here is a grandmother, except for, I think except for two. <clears throat> And uh, the trip was just, a lot of these trips too, they're, they're very challenging physically and mentally, which is where there's a lot of growth that happens for the players because, you know, they can't go home after a bad game because like, we're in New York. <laughs> like, you have to stick it out. Once they get on that plane, there's no leaving. So that really forces them to use each other and to use their skills in a way that they become confident in their ability to go after life. So the first night, actually the night before we left, they were so nervous about change and doing something positive, we had to have a slumber party for these grown women to make sure they'd all show up to the flight the next day. <clears throat> we get on our flight in Sacramento, it's delayed. Everything on this trip went a little bit wrong. We get on the plane, and a lot of them haven't gone that long without smoking a cigarette, so they're just like patches all over, and they're like freaking out. Like, they're all getting their last cigarette in like before we, we get on the plane. We get, uh, we get to New York, and we landed like 2 a.m. in the morning. We learned that our housing situation had changed drastically. 
Um, but they had a ride coming for us, which was this blacked out like limo party bus. We we're like, all right, cool. And then it takes us down to, have you ever been to like Ward Island in New York? Super sketchy, it's like a Law and Order episode. <laughs> we're like going down by the water, the women are freaking out and they're just like, what is this? And we're getting taken to a men's uh, like crisis shelter, all men's crisis shelter. We have like seven, six or seven women. So it's like two or three in the morning, we get in there, uh, one bathroom, and we go into the gym, and they had set up all these cots for all of the women to be in, or all the players, so it's all the cities are just spread out. And a few of our women have been institutionalized. So like, they immediately go into this environment and just like click, like something just happened. Like one woman, I, I turned away for like five minutes and she's got a bandana on and she's just like pacing, she's like <laughs> looking at people, like watching everything. <laughs> and I was like, dude, what just happened to you? <laughs> so anyway, so. We get up, we go to the games the next morning, we go to the fields, we're gonna come down here, we go to the fields, and we get our uniforms. So we look like we're together. And, and then it rains, it's just like it rains and the courts are slippery, like nothing went the way it was supposed to. We lost almost every single, I think we lost every single game for the first two days. And they, they had good spirits still, because they were having fun, like it wasn't a big deal, they are surrounded by positivity. So um, we, we go to the last, the last games in Times Square. Everybody gets to play a game in Times Square. It's pretty sweet. It's like, how is this happening? Um, and then uh, we are playing the team San Francisco, and we're, we're doing well. We're almost, we're like tied. So the game, it's seven to seven at the end, it's tied. So you go into penalty kicks. And a penalty kick is you go from the middle of the court, one person against the goalie all by themselves. You know, if you make it, you make it. If you don't, you don't. So the San Francisco team lines up to go and our 55-year-old goalie, who cannot bend over, somehow blocks it. <laughs> okay. So, and now it's our turn to score. We have one chance. If we make it, we win the game in front of all these hundreds of people who are watching. And uh, this one woman, Eliana, she had been in a, an abusive relationship for eight, eight to ten years, heavy, heavy drug user. She had four kids of her own that were under eight. And um, just, again, when we met her, like, no confidence, no self-worth, always in bad relationships. She just didn't feel like she was worth anything good. Um, and she didn't have the confidence to, to move forward. So we had worked with her prior to this tournament about penalty kicks. This just happened to be the first one that we had an opportunity to do. We were trying to show her how to do a penalty kick. We're like, so you want to get the goalie to like lean one way, and then you kick the ball where they're not. If you guys can see me. And so she's kind of like looking back at us, puzzled, She's like, well, I can't really do that with my feet, but like, could I do, like, if the idea is to distract them, can I do like a cartwheel? And we're like, yeah, like, definitely. Like, so, uh, so, so Times Square, our 55-year-old goalie just makes a heroic save, and then Eliana comes up. And she met up with the shots then. Oh, the skills that you yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, yeah, by far the most exciting moment I have ever experienced in soccer. Like, we like lost our minds. And so, I mean, that video shows you that is not a fearful person. Like she saw a moment, she saw an opportunity, and she took it, and she was like on a large stage. And this was, I wanted to show you this because this is what the changes that we see in the women that we work with. We've worked with like close to 40 women. It looks different for them individually, but their ability to go after life is what changes. And the game is what provides these opportunities because life doesn't for them. The game seems to be the first space for them to learn this about themselves and then they can apply it in life. But for whatever reason, it just hasn't happened the other way around. So um, it was epic. We won nothing. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it's become what I get with, with the game and the value of it is we've seen that, whether it's a soccer field or, uh, I'm sure there's other ways to do it, but the soccer field has been, for us, what's, what's been this sort of catalyst for change, but it really provides, you could call it a platform, you call it an incubator. You could call it, um, you know, just a, a space for community and self-discovery. 
but, but Eliana is like 99% of the people that that's what happens to them. And that's why we do what we do. And we, we don't win very much um, and we don't get more money for doing it and you know, they get participation medals. But like you can't undo something like that and that's where they, they go on to be successful. So um, the last thing is I'll just say, you know, we're a small nonprofit here. If you guys ever want to get involved, here's some, I have cards and my information. We are going to be a part of the big day of giving. If you guys want to give to us, we, you know, we very much appreciate it. Um, you can volunteer. And then, you know, the most exciting thing that we haven't actually announced yet is that we will be having the Street Soccer USA National Cup in Sacramento this year. So, <laughs> super excited about that. It will be at Capitol Mall in October. So, you know, when you do hear about it, like, please come check it out and you can witness our Sacramento players and the other 250 that are coming from around the country to, to play here and kind of see how the game can impact them. So thank you very much. Thank you.